In today's episode, I got some exciting news and I'm introducing a new segment called Self-Help Tips. And in today's, we're gonna talk about how to have better boundaries when you hit a tough situation. Thank you for joining us on Breaking Free from Narcissistic Abuse, where we talk about strategies, tips, and tricks on navigating and recovering from narcissistic abuse. I'm your host, Dr. Carrie McAvoy, a mental health clinician with over 20 years experience and author of Love You More, a graphic inside look at my experience of a toxic relationship. And I'm your other co-host, Tara Blair Ball, a certified relationship coach and abuse survivor and author of Reclaim and Recover, Heal from Toxic Relationships with a seven-step guided journal. We're thrilled that you're here with us today. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes and leave us a review and let us know what you think of the show. You can find me at Instagram at Carrie McAvoy, PhD. And I'm at Tara.RelationshipCoach. I am so excited to be back this season and I have a huge announcement that I I just am over the moon about and that is I'm being joined with a co-host Tara Blair Ball. You know, at, as I wrapped up season 1 and thought about the journey that I've been on with uh, with all of you as listeners, um I realized that I needed more. I needed to add another piece to this, something that made it unique, someone to sort of bounce things off of and get another opinion. Um, monologues are a lot of hard work, and sometimes you need the energy and the creativity of another person to sort of jolt new ideas and to take it to new places. And so when I was thinking about doing interviews, I reached out to a good friend. I've known her for a while now, uh, Tara Blairball, and asked if she'd be an interviewer. And she said, hey, what about being a co-host? And wow, my mind blew. So I'm so excited to announce that she's going to be on here for season two. And maybe going forward, we're going to see where this kind of this adventure takes us. So Tara, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've been doing, what your interests are, your thoughts about abuse and relationships? Yeah, I'm so glad to be here, Carrie. I'm so excited that this worked out. Uh, I think we're a very uh, good match and feels very kismet, you know. Um, so I am a certified relationship coach. My background is in relationship coaching, but I also have certifications in cognitive behavioral techniques, emotional intelligence, happiness, life purpose, all that kind of stuff. Um, I have written three books, uh, two of which are specific for couples and happy, safe relationships, sort of improving their connection and emotional intimacy. But sort of the, my most recent book and the one that's more dear and nearest to my own personal journey is my recent one, which came out in December. It's called Reclaim and Recover, Heal from Toxic uh, Relationships with a Seven-Step Guided Journal. It specifically deals with my experience, as well as how I've walked through clients and a lot of uh, science-backed research on how to particularly recover from relationships that are toxic, unhealthy, and or abusive. My, uh, my first marriage was actually incredibly, uh, incredibly abusive in multiple ways. There was emotional abuse, mental abuse, definitely a lot of gaslighting, uh, as well as physical abuse, both around me, like punching walls, that kind of thing, as well as to me at the end of that relationship. And when I left that relationship is when I realized that I was, I just was a fucking wreck. I just was like, it's, I felt like I'd put a, I'd thrown a, a grenade into my own life and into my own self. And I didn't know how to piece myself back together. And that's when I really started my own healing journey. And then I started, um, once I got through that and started dating and found love again and that's how I've continued to guide clients in that specific, in that specific process. And it really is a journey and it's an ongoing journey. I still have things that trigger me years down the line that are specific to how things were in that first marriage. And it's still something I'm having to go through, but the duration frequency and intensity have definitely lessened. And that's, that's been a lot of the progress for me is just recognizing that of like, oh, this did come up and that sucks. And I don't want to deal with this again, but it is less and it, it ha you know, it goes on for less of a time and it's definitely a process. And I think that's one way that we really connect. It's just having those sort of relationships that just sort of annihilate us and how to, but then we come back better. So maybe we're just Phoenixes, Carrie. <laughs> yeah, I can really yeah the annihilation oh man i can relate to that yes it does do that doesn't it mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. So how did you actually get, I mean, one thing that I didn't say to the audience is that you are a writer first, would you say that? Mm -hmm. Or yeah, so how did you get into that? Was that part of the healing or did that come out of something else? And, but I, I know that it's been wedded. So I, I was kind of curious how that came together. Yeah. So I've always been a writer. I like told myself when I was in third grade, that that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, but what I found particularly helpful and when I was attempting to recover from this relationship was sort of documenting my process because it was a way to sort of connect with other people, realize I wasn't alone. Um, and then that started years and years ago. And I started building a fan base on that of just connecting with these other people and that kind of thing. Um, and it segued into a lot of other writing opportunities, um, uh, like doing an advice column for Zeus, the dating app and several other options. I wrote articles about Tinder. I wrote a lot of different relationship and dating advice because that's where the space I was in. I literally was actively dating, actively searching for a partner. So it made sense. And then I was on the other side of it. I'd met my now husband on Tinder. We started dating, building a relationship. And I still was using writing as a way to sort of process and go through that. Just like, I mean, journaling is so impactful. I just was journaling for a lot of, a lot of eyes. Um, I then transitioned to um, social platforms like Instagram and TikTok and um, b sort of building an online presence in that way and meeting clients that way. I used to just meet clients, you know, at the coffee shop or at my house, you know, but then I built an online presence. All my clients today are do not live in my area. And we work together that way. And it's built since then. I've since had uh, two books. One is Grateful in Love. And another one is a couple's goals journal. And then the one that came out recently, those were all publishers who contacted me through my social media followings and asked if I had any ideas. That's awesome. I know I started yeah. following you way back in 2019. And I oh, think, yeah, awesome. you're yeah, I know you had this large following on Medium, and I, I think you were primarily in the relationship topics at that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would have said you were very solidly on how to build a healthier relationship. But I think for me, coming to realize your abuse history was sort of, you know, through snippets, it's through pieces of it until you kind of, mm -hmm. was that a process, do you think, coming to terms of that part of your identity? Yeah, yeah, I wish I could put it in some like magic diamond form where it's really crystallized. But yeah, it was, I mean, part of it, like the title of the book, Reclaim and Recover, I, I really had to claim that for myself of just being an abuse survivor and what that meant, what that looked like. I was very judgy of the term abuse survivor. I didn't want to feel like that was still connected to me. I didn't want that to be a part of my past. But it, it was a part of my past, even way before that romantic relationship. My my mother was very abusive. I'm no contact with her today and haven't had any contact with her in about five years. She's never met my youngest daughter, that kind of thing. And recognizing that abuse survivor is actually an empowering statement of it's something that we've overcome. It's something that we've, we've grown from, we've learned from, and we're not going to settle for or stand for in the future. Recognizing that part of it too and a lot of that came from just the identification of those who responded like you who commented and had could relate on those on those levels yeah you i had the same sort of trajectory when i mean i come from a long history of abuse as well uh, all the way back and i rejected it so severely that i wouldn't even see trauma patients as a clinician oh. Yeah, I, I just had that as my personal standard. I I wouldn't I I didn't want to know about it. I didn't want to get trained in it. I didn't want to hear other people's experiences about it. Now, granted, you can't stop that from happening in the office. People come in for other reasons, and sure enough, they have abuse history. But I didn't want to advertise that. And yeah. calling myself a victim, I I was a survivor, mm -hmm. or I just didn't use a word at all. But lately, I would say in the last few years, I've embraced the term abuse survive um, abuse victim. And I find it very empowering. Like I'm standing in my my uh, story, and I'm standing in the strength that I was resilient to come through something really horrific. That it's amazing how that term victim has so much shame attached to it. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's it's own, taking that on is a way for me to reject the shame. I reject people attributing something wrong with me for my history. It's not my fault. I've survived mm -hmm. something. 
it's it's a victory that I survived something. Yeah, I love that. I love that, Carrie. You're so right. Yeah, it's it. So I'm, I'm I was fascinated when you said that. It's like wow, I, I've been on that. I really have been on that. And there's so much um, so much anger that's uh, towards abuse victims that I think is really misdirected and should be placed elsewhere. Culture, society, training. You know the abuser all of that so where do you see your what do you why don't you give us a little bit of view of what you're doing now and where you're kind of seeing yourself heading and and then maybe what some of the hopes you all have for this podcast yeah so i my passion has always been in helping people that were in the place that i was and i had sort of gotten away from that and was working with a lot of couples on improving their relationships but it would be about like connection and communication. And it's not that I don't love that. That's something I work on with my own husband and our relationship. But just my passion point has always been in helping those people that were in that very unique place. Because there's, I just don't think there's anything like it. I just don't. And so moving men and women, I work with, um, I work with both clients in that area, but moving them from that place where they just look like a husk of themselves and moving to a better place uh, is a big passion point. So that's why I, I wrote this book. I actually meet with my publisher later this month to talk about another book. And my I have several ideas for next steps in that, but some of them, some of them involve you know, how to, how to begin dating or how to address toxic family relationships. Because I think a lot, I think there's not enough that's talked about with that specifically. We, we hear a lot about toxic romantic relationships, but toxic family relationships are often where it starts for all of us. And then that's why we choose our toxic romantic relationships because they feel familiar and normal, which was definitely the case for me. Um, I've also thought about looking at something I had to address. I don't know if this is part of your journey, Carrie, but part of what I had to address when I came out of that really toxic marriage was all of the toxic behaviors that I had developed as a result of being in that relationship. Um, and that I'd had even in relationships with nice, healthy partners before that, that where I would avoid, distract, deflect, I would, I would definitely gaslight. A lot of it was emotional immaturity and what I had seen modeled. Like I really had to look at that for myself, that if I want to, I want to have a different kind of relationship, I also need to learn how to show up in that relationship in a different way and moving from codependency to codependency had been a big hallmark of my relationships and being a savior and finding, finding the really broken guy and fixing him. And uh, so I see, I see my work going forward as focusing on those things. And I see this podcast is just a way to really amplify that. And I know too, that those of us who have gotten out of an unhealthy, toxic, abusive, narcissistic relationship and then trying to find love again is really scary and hard. And so I see that as something that you and I can work through and help help the people who listen to it too work through because it's it's tough and uncomfortable. Uh, and we can, at least in my experience, sabotage those relationships and have to work through that again too. Yeah, yeah, and I bet you you hear all the time, and I'd love to know your opinion on it. something we can also pursue further down the road. But it's interesting that you moved from a toxic relationship and then developed a healthy relationship. But one of the things people think is you need to heal first before you can do it again. And you know, I don't life's never that neat. But so I love watching how your life is kind of unfolded, how you've been healing in the journey. That's how I kind of see it. You've been taking what you're learning and then actively applying it to yourself, but also applying it as information and increasing awareness and really advocating for health and wellness. So I love that about that. And I, I agree. I, I think that um you no, know, it's interesting. I, there's all sorts of victims. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about that. Your story is a little different in mine. In fact, that you kind of owned codependency a bit and talk about it. Those who've been listening to me know that I hate that word. and I don't <laughs> own it. But I have to say that I, I learned a lot of um, helplessness, not like learned helplessness that I can't do things for myself or I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. But but um, compliance, I'm overly compliant and easygoing. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, you're right. I had to walk out of that relationship and say, being mute is not a good thing. It's not conflict helpful, it's conflict avoidant. And um, yeah, and I had to really like learn new skills. So I agree with you. I think that's exciting thing that we can talk about this year is 
how how we've come out of it, the sort of the things that we see that's not helpful, and then how can we begin to bring? I, I want to be about healing this year. That's that's a big focus of mine personally in my life. Uh, also, really much on my platform everywhere. I really want to focus on on learning new techniques, getting in touch with ourselves, integrating with ourselves better. Because one of the things I've discovered, and I I, I know that you've kind of talk about it in a sort of sideways different ways, but is that we fragment we really uh in order to survive something you can't stay you can't stay integrated and be wholly present you have mm -hmm. to you have to numb out check out dissociate uh d deny avoid distract compartment you'll do something to cope and i i want my life and i really want all of our lives to reintegrate again for us to be because here's the thing if you're not feeling the scary feelings and the the shameful feelings and the angry feelings, then you're not having a lot of joy and excitement mm -hmm. and and peacefulness because you're avoiding all feelings. You can't just pick and choose in your head. It doesn't work that way. So I, I would like to embrace a fuller, more joyful life. And I, I see you and I having that that set goal for this year. I'm super, super excited about it. I love that. I think we should make reintegrate or something as like our our season two word or something like that. I think that would be cool. I love that. That's a great idea. That's a really great yeah, I idea. I love that too. Yeah. And back to your point about the fully healed before being in a relationship. Um, I, I talk about this all the time and I also get really mean hate comments about it too. Um, you know, I... I personally did a ton of healing. I was working with two different therapists. I was working with a coach. I was doing doing all of these books. I was reading all of these things while I was single and in an attempt to heal myself fully before getting in a, in a romantic relationship. Uh, well, I got into the romantic relationship and actually faced some of the triggers that I, it wasn't possible for me to face while I was single. It just was the case. And a, a story I talk about a lot is I went with my my now husband, we were on a date and he got a flat tire and he pulled this truck in the parking lot and I felt myself tense up and feel anxious because I thought he was going to yell or scream at me. That's what I was expecting because that's what had been my normal in previous relationships. And I mean, he was like, just get in, just get in the truck. It's raining. It's cold. I'll, I'll deal with the tire. Well, I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to stand and watch and and I guess be there in case he needed me. But the whole time I was, that's what I was expecting because that had been my normal. And at the end of that, when the, you know, he was back in the truck and the tire was fixed and all that kind of stuff, I actually thanked him for not yelling at me because yeah. And at the time he was like, why would I yell at you? But being with an abusive partner who would yell, who would lash out at me whenever something was inconvenient, uncomfortable, frustrating to me, frustrating to him it was always somehow my fault and so I took that that was a way that my codependency definitely manifested as I really tried to make his life gravy and everything fine and everything nice and rosy because I was trying to avoid abuse and protect myself yeah. but in my in this relationship that I'm in now I I really had to deal with deal with that trigger and learn new experiences and have that not be my normal anymore yeah, yeah. My first attention to this, and we can talk about this more, but I did equine therapy. I had like uh -huh. one one brief experience at a retreat, and we were supposed to clean a horse's hoof. That was the job. And my horse is being uncooperative. Now, remember, I grew up, I don't know if you know this, but I grew up on a dairy farm. I grew up around large animals. Large animals do not intimidate me. I know how to handle mm -hmm. them. I've been around, I mean, dealt with it for years. So I was feeling all confidence, went in there sort of with a swagger and the horse wouldn't want to lift it. Now I'd never cleaned a horse's hooves before. That was new, but it wouldn't, wouldn't lift its hoof for me. And I started like patting it and talking to it, trying to calm it down or whatever. And I did get the task done. I was feeling so proud of myself and go back and I talked to the therapist. He said, why did you reward the horse bad behavior with comfort? Mm. He said, you don't reward bad behavior with kindness. I felt, I, I, I had heard you had to really hold it together for these because they're so powerful. Oh my, I felt undone. Just because it's, by the way, it's said publicly in front of other people. Oh, I, know. <laughs> I know, but I- That's not shaming at all. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. But that was my first look into what I have now. 
I hate to say, and this is something maybe we can even work on this year. I'm not for sure what else to do. How do you get an uncooperative animal that weighs many, many times you to behave? I don't really still know, but it was an eye-opening experience for me. Really eye-opening. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm super excited about this year and where we're going to go. We're going to do something new. So why don't we talk about the new things that will be happening in the podcast? You had some brilliant ideas that I love, which is like why I love having a co-host. But what? <laughs> yeah. So we're going to talk about, we're going to include a tip or hack in every episode. And these are going to be pointed towards helping you, helping you wherever you are in your journey. Um, the one today that I'm super excited about, and we'll talk about that more when we get to it, but we're, we're going to be curating specifically which tips and hacks we want to use for you and suggest for you because we've used them and they've worked for us. They've worked for our clients and we think they'll be really impactful for you specifically in your own journey, whether you're trying to leave the relationship or out of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that too. I think that's great. And we'll end, I, I, I'm, we're going to end the podcast with a tip and hack. So every week when you come, you're going to hear that helpful hint to sort of apply to your life. And we would love to know what you, your reaction to it is. Does it work? Did you hate it? Did you love it? Was it something you'd never even heard of before? But uh, I hope that you'll leave us a comment. Uh, you can even watch this on YouTube or send us an email, get a hold of us through Instagram on our, our, our accounts. We're going to make sure that Tara's handles in the show notes, just like mine are. So I would love to know what you guys think of this change. And uh, so I'm so excited. Thank you so much for doing this and that joining me this year. And I can't wait for us to get into next week and talk about our next top topic. Oh, let me stop there. There's another big change. It has been twice a week going forward. We're going to be here on Monday. So you can tune in on every Monday to catch the next episode. But next week, I hope you're back and listen to how to set reasonable expectations for ourselves in 2023. Because we often think about that in terms of health or wellness, but I also want us to think about it in terms of relationships and ourself. So that will be the topic next week. Today's self-help tip is to develop a steel backbone. This is a little technique that I developed for myself. I found myself really struggling to hold boundaries with my children, but it could be with any kind of relationship. It doesn't have to just be with between parent and children. It could be with a partner or somebody at work. I would find myself kind of giving in and losing ground. So when I started imagining that I actually had a steel backbone on something, in other words, that I was like a rod that it planted in on the ground on this one point, it helped me then to visualize it when I started to be buffeted or pushed on it, that I was planted, that I wasn't going to move off of it. So I know it can feel silly to think of a mental image, but it's amazing how that can transfer or affect how we behave and what we do and the decisions that we make. So try this and what, see what you think. Yeah, Carrie, I think that's such a fantastic idea. I love the metaphor of the steel backbone. So audience members, if you try this or you've had experience attempting to try this, let us know how it works for you. And if you can imagine your own steel backbone or if you have another metaphor that you think would work better for you, let us know. Let us know what you think of this episode. And if you tried the self-help tip, how did it go? We would love to hear how it went. Drop us a comment or send us an email. And are you following us on social media? We'd love to connect with you there. And we'll see you back here next Monday.